I am excited to be here again, giving classes without quizzes. So I hated to give quizzes because ultimately there was somebody who got a B and would come to office hours to complain. Um, uh, so I started in 1968 and I retired in 2004, but then I taught for three more years, exploring human nature, uh, understanding the psychology of mind control. Um, and um, during that time, I, I guess I taught more different classes to more students than any, anybody in Stanford history. Uh, I even taught a class in Mem Ord for 1,200 students at a time, uh, but I quit that. And so usually I would teach in Jordan Hall. I helped design the lecture hall, which was about 300 people. Um, and the problem is, if you're on a stage, then you have to be a performer. And I ended up being a performer, playing videos and doing demonstrations, uh, et cetera. So uh, what I'm going to do today is take you on a, a personal journey for 40, 43 minutes. Uh, my journey from creating Evo, we'll revisit the Stanford Prison Study and the movie made about it, to now my career is inspiring heroism. Uh, what I have done is the last 10 years, I'm the founder and president of something called the Heroic Imagination Project, or HIP. Uh, and I'd love you to visit our website, which we'll get to in just a moment. So my focus for a long time has been on studying the psychology of evil. Uh, what makes good people go wrong? And I was one of the people who, uh, not only in the Stanford prison study, but I got involved in defending one of our prison guards, uh, American prison guards in Abu Ghraib prison, uh, uh, who in 2004, who did horrendous things. But Abu Ghraib prison was really the Stanford prison study on steroids. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, I looked at uh, different kinds of evil. Uh, what happens when you make people anonymous? Uh, uh, evil not only in experiments. Uh, I'll mention Stanley Milgram. He and I were high school classmates in the Bronx in New York. Uh, and what I'm going to do today, which, which is new, uh, I'm going to ask later how many of you are in my class, but I, I just always had something new in every lecture. Uh, and I'm going to have a little political twist on Stanley Milgram's study, which, again, it said, all evil begins with pressing a 15-volt switch, which you hardly notice. But the problem is you're on a slippery slope of evil. And each, each, um, each time you press the button, things get worse and worse. And we're going to <coughs> talk about the rise of, of right-wing dictatorships around the world, including in America. So one of the reasons I have been studying evil is because I grew up in poverty from uneducated Sicilian uh, migrant parents. And this is what the South Bronx looked like uh, when I was a child. It looks like a third world country. Now, one of the things about living in a place like this, and here's our playground. We had to climb that fence in order to get into an uh, 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 asphalt uh, softball field. Um, and when, you're, when you live in a ghetto, any ghetto around the world, it doesn't matter if it's America, if it's Brazil, if it's uh, anywhere, uh, you realize that poverty is a systemic evil that uh, inner city life breeds a seductive evil for kids. There are always men, hustlers, who will give you money to do things, to steal, to carry a package. You know it's narcotics from here to there. And I remember even then, this was in the 40s, you got $10. You know, $10 was like a week's worth of salary, a day salary for your, for your father when he was working. Um, so essentially, uh, I'm always concerned that I had friends who took that temptation to do bad things for money, and I and other friends didn't. So as a kid, I was really a child psychologist because I asked the question, what is the difference between people who give into temptation and people who re resist temptation? Um, and then it wasn't until I got to be a psychologist, I said, wow, here's the kind of thing that I could study in a formal way. The last thing before going on is that uh, poverty is an evil. I call it a systemic evil. I'll talk about three different kinds of evil. And in America now, 21%, it says 20 here, that was last, 21% of all children in America grow up below the poverty level. And this is true around the world. And there's lots of research that show that if you grow up in a disadvantaged um, uh, circumstance, it affects everything about you. It's not just the toxic air is bad. The food you eat, uh, everything about your environment uh, is uh, handicaps you for the rest of your life. 
So there are three kinds of evil. The one we think mostly about is an evil person. Um, and this is like personal disposition. This is what you say is a bad apple. So in Abu Ghraib, uh, we, um, the, the government said the soldiers who did those terrible things to the Iraqi prisoners were bad apples. And then I introduced the concept of situational evil, that is physical and uh, social environments that can corrupt good people, and that's the bad barrel. But then there's this third level, it's the systemic evil, and that's organizational influences, political, economic, cultural, and legal. And so these are the bad barrel makers. So now when you want to change behavior or prevent it, you have to work at all these three levels, that we want to change the individual, but you have to really change the situation they're in, and then who has the power to change the situation. So this is the kinds of things that I've been interested in. So uh, the amazing thing is, uh, the most extreme example of systemic evil is every year the Chinese government knowingly kills one million men. Every year. That's more than all the deaths and all the wars going on, all the terrorist attacks. But why do they do it? They encourage men to smoke. 54% of all Chinese men smoke regularly. That is 320 million men smoke regularly. And curiously, only 2% of women. So it's the biggest gender gap in the world, because usually in most countries, it's women are like 10 to 15%. Why do they do it? They own the cigarette monopoly. They make 305, uh, 605 billion yen a year. And the government also controls the media, so they prevent anti-smoking campaigns as we have uh, here. So, uh, so the newest data is by uh, 2030, it, it'll go from 1 million to 2 million, by 2050, 3 million men will die every year. And I gave this lecture in China some years ago, and I said to young people, you should be alarmed. There should be some you know, social action against this. And there has been none, because the Chinese government suppresses it. The interesting thing is, what did they do with the money? Good things. They create schools. So here's a picture of the Sichuan uh, tobacco, uh, Sichuan, um, pri Sichuan Tobacco Primary School, that's what it's called. And if you can read Chinese, and there's actually a website, uh, tobaccochina.com, it says, ingenuity is the fruit of diligence. Tobacco will help you succeed. So this is mind control at a systemic level. Now, uh, before we get to the prison study and research I've done, uh, I want to focus for just a minute on the fact that right-wing governments are becoming popular in Europe and America. Now, those of you who are my age, we grew up with fascism and communism that dominated Europe for decades. But now, uh, exclusionary thinking is growing worldwide. In Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, the prime minister, says, migrants are poison and are not needed. So he was the first one to present an anti-migrant program four or five years ago before there were any migrants uh, uh, on the way. In Poland, the ruling law and justice party wants to amend conservative abortion laws to ban all abortions for any reason. President Trump calls for a total and complete shutdown of immigrants entering America. The problem is that every single person in America has come from an immigrant background, except for Native Americans. Uh, right now, Jars Bolsonaro, Brazil's presidential frontrunner, is not only right-wing, he's anti-gay, and like Trump, He's a climate change denier. So totalitarian dangers to democracy, and they are dangers to democracy, come gradually but systemic, systematically. I mentioned Stanley Milgram. He did the famous studies in the 60s of blind obedience to authority, where he, got, uh, he, he studied uh, men, uh, middle-aged men, not college students, men 20 to 50 in New Haven, Connecticut, and he put them in a situation where an authority in a lab coat encouraged them to give uh, increasingly uh, 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 lethal shocks to their student whenever the student made a mistake. And it was all rigged, so the student kept making mistakes. And you started with 15 volts on the shock generator, and it, uh, with 15 volt increments, 15, 30, 45. Uh, and when you press 15, there was no reaction. But now you're on that slippery slope. When you got to 100, the person started screaming, uh, yelling, it's hurting me. And then the question is, who would go to the end? And the end was 450 volts. The surprising result was two out of every three American citizens of these, a thousand, he, he tested a thousand people, 
65% went all the way to the end. So this is, this is ex example of the blind obedience to authority. So I say all evil begins with 15 volts. And what I've done is for you, um, I, I prepared a, a totalitarian shock box simulating Milgram's um, procedure. Uh, <laughs> I was supposed to be the shock box, he's not doing it. So each level is more and more control. Control the media, control the judiciary, uh, replace elected <laughs> And finally, total political domination. And the problem is it's gradual. So you, the first things don't seem very, very serious, as in the Milgram study. But again, the warning is when you see any of these signs, you know the direction is going. It's only going to get worse, only going to get more extreme. So next is a, a, a classic example of situational evil that I created that you know back in 1971. We put an ad in, in the Palo Alto Times, wanted college students for a study of prison life. You get paid um, $15 a day. Uh, 75 people answered the ad. We gave them personality tests. We picked 24 most normal, most healthy. And we randomly assigned half would be guards, half would be prisoners. And, and they weren't told what to do as guards or prisoners. Um, and uh, again, it was 1971. Uh, and nobody wanted to be a guard because guards, uh, uh, policemen ca had come onto the Stanford campus, those of you who were in that era, uh, to protest students. Um, to uh, stifle, protect, uh, suppress students who were politically active against the Vietnam War, including me. Uh, and so student, nobody wanted to be a guard because policemen and guards were seen as uh, uh, pigs. Uh, but so here then was the guards in their, their military uniform. Prisoners were in smocks with numbers. And they were de-individuated. They became their number. Uh, and the study was supposed to go for two weeks but I had to end it early after only six days. In 1971, Phil Zimbardo conducted a revolutionary experiment here in the bowels of Stanford University in the United States. It rocked the world of psychology. A group of students were divided randomly into prisoners and guards and lived in a makeshift jail. The prisoners immediately became submissive and the guards became cruel. Within a week, Phil Zimbardo's prison was inhumane and the experiment had to be cut short. There's now an interesting Hollywood movie on which I was a consultant, which is about 90% accurate. In fact, the movie is very dramatic, but they reduce uh, six days down to two hours. So in fact, many of the most dramatic things in the real study could not even be included in the movie. But this is, um, it's on Netflix, it's available free. Uh, so here's the trailer, which is very uh, powerful. <clears throat> Would you rather be a guard or a prisoner? I don't think I have the qualities to be a guard. Prisoner. Prisoner, I guess. Prisoner sounds like it would be a little less work. Prisoner. What's that? Nobody likes guards. Nobody likes guards. Good afternoon, gentlemen. This experiment will be an extension of my research into the effects prisons can have on human behavior. You're going to be pleased to know that you all have been chosen to be the prison guards. But under no circumstances whatsoever are you to physically assault the prisoners in any way. So remember, just as you were watching the prisoners, my graduate staff and I will be watching you. All right, gentlemen, we all have ourselves a lot of fun. Rule number one, prisoners must remain silent. This is an exercise period. OK, is it just me, or are these guys taking this thing a bit too seriously? Why don't you give me 20 push-ups? <laughs> Look at this guy. He thinks he's John Wayne or something. You address me as Mr. Correctional officer. This might be an interesting two weeks after all. Why don't you make up your bunk, 8612? I did, Mr. Correctional Officer. Well, that's not what I see. Hey, what are you doing? I just made that!
What was that? You just hit him. You're not supposed to hit him. Should we step in? No. Let the guards figure it out. Let's see where it goes. Good evening, gentlemen. How about we make this one a night to remember? This is all real. They won't let you go. They won't let us leave. Those are not prisoners. Those are not subjects. Those are boys, and you are harming them. Me neither. Uh, uh, so the, I wrote a, uh, when I finished the study, I only wrote a few articles about it because it, it was not a big deal. It was just a demonstration of situational power uh, added to the Milgram study. Uh, I did, I, I did, I, what I did is I went on to do research on the psychology of shyness uh, with my students, and we created the first, we were the first people to study shyness uh, in adolescents and adults. I wrote some books called Shyness, What It Is, What They Do About It. And we started a clinic at Stanford, um, Stanford Shyness Clinic, uh, which is now still in operation in Palo Alto University. And we are 100% effective in treating people who, are, who shyness inhibits. Uh, and we can ask questions later, how do, how do we get 100% cure of anything? Uh, but the Looser Effect has 10 chapters on the prison study. And again, I did this. Uh, in 2007, after I was involved in Abu Ghraib, because then I wanted to, I put the Stanford Prison Study in a broader, broader context. Um, so my work has proven that there are circumstances that make ordinary people do bad things. But at the end of that book, I asked the question, are there circumstances that can make ordinary people do good things? And so I, we interviewed uh, President Obama when he was just elected, and we asked him, uh, to become a hero, do you have to be a special person? And what he's going to talk about is uh, the woman who started the civil rights movement to stop desegregation of blacks in the South, Rosa Parks. You know, uh, what's remarkable about uh, history is uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, you know, last year Rosa Parks passed away. Uh, and you know, I, I remember sitting on this stage with world leaders and Bill Clinton and senators and governors and, and thinking uh, we were all paying homage to a seamstress uh, who had transformed the country and, and helped transform the world. Uh, you know, we, we never know sort of how our actions are going to ripple uh, over time. Uh, but each of us can take some responsibility for making sure that uh, we are pushing a little bit in the direction of justice and, and in the direction of equality and the direction of tolerance. And, uh, when we do that, uh, uh, we may surprise ourselves with the amount of influence that, in fact, we have just by standing up or speaking up. Really a critical message that everybody should realize how much power you have as an individual if you're willing to stand up, speak out against injustice and for, and for justice, for a moral cause. Uh, so this is Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, as some of you know, was a seamstress. She fixed dresses and made dresses for rich women in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and one day she got on the bus. Uh, in the background is Martin Luther King, in that picture uh, to your uh, left. Um, and uh, she refused to sit in the back of the bus in the colored section. She was taken and put in prison. Th this is her. She was prisoner, 7053. But her action uh, started a civil rights movement that from that time has desegregated transportation in the United States. So again, here's a, sim a simple person, uh, a simple woman, uh, not a political activist, uh, who uh, took a position, uh, st stood up, spoke out, and said, I refuse to pay the same money to sit in the back of the bus, uh, as, and I want to sit wherever I choose. Uh, now, uh, usually when we think about heroes, we we focus really on male military heroes, warriors. We have a whole history of it from Agamemnon and Achilles from the, from the Greek, uh, Greek myths. Uh, but we don't recognize the number of women and even younger people. Uh, so in, um, I have a, uh, uh, Joanna, are you here? I have a visiting scholar from, from Poland. Uh, and in Poland, during the Warsaw Ghetto, the Nazis put 400,000 Jews in a, in a tiny area with a starvation diet. Uh, and the idea was that um, um, uh, 
After a while, old people and children would die, and whoever was left, they'd ship to concentration camp. Her name was Irina Sendra. When she heard about this, uh, she organized 18 other women and one guy into what I call a hero squad, and they arranged with the, with the rabbi to, to allow people, uh, parents, to have their children uh, taken out. They found an underground sewer, and in one year, they saved 2,500 children from sure death. And now, 50 years later, more than 10,000 Jews around the world owe their lives to this heroic woman. Uh, now, another woman was um, um, uh, Christina Maslach, who had been my graduate student at Stanford, um, uh, graduated in June, was a, pro a beginning professor at, um, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, and I invited her down uh, on Thursday night, uh, halfway, uh, three quarters of the way through the study, and she saw the guards uh, what the guards would did regularly, abuse the prisoners, put chains on their legs, put bags over their head, uh, curse them, push them. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying it's a 10 o'clock toilet run, 10 o'clock at night, this is what happens, it's no big deal. It's, it's, here's what happens in the morning, here's what happens at lunch, we have parole days, we have visiting days, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And she ran out to the, in front of the, it was Jordan Hall, ran out in the courtyard, we have a big argument, and suddenly she says, you have been changed by the situation more than anybody else. Uh, you, you know, I, I know you as a caring, loving professor. You love students. And how could you see students being abused and not, and not stop it? Now, she never said you should stop the experiment. But then she said, we had started a romantic relationship. And she said, if this is the real you, I'm not sure I want to continue our relationship. And, uh, and so I ended the study the next day on day six out of 14. And this is what it sounds like uh, in a, a, a recent um, uh, biography of the study. Fifth day of the study, Zimbardo invited his girlfriend, recent psychology graduate, Christina Maslach, to visit the mock prison. I had heard bits and pieces uh, from Phil uh, about what was going on. And then when I was down there that evening, it really was kind of a wow. The thing that really got to me was when some of the guards took the prisoners down the hall to the men's room. She looks out and sees a line of the prisoners with paper bags over their heads, each one holding the other one's shoulder. And they're leading them down the hall. And Phil comes over and I, look, look, you know, my God, look at that. And I looked up and something about it just, you know, again, it was the dehumanizing, demeaning kind of treatment. I just, I couldn't watch it. And she said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. And she's got tears in her eyes. I said, what? And she runs out. And I'm, and I'm furious, I'm saying, you know, I'm saying, look, this is, you know, I run outside, we have this big argument. I'm saying, look, this is, this is dynamics of human behavior. Look, it's fascinating, the power of the situation. All of so I'm giving her all the psychological basis and what kind of psychologist are you? You don't appreciate this. Um, and she said, I don't understand. You're a stranger to me. I don't understand this. How could you not see what I see? I mean, you know, you're a caring, compassionate person. I know you from all of these other things. Something's gone wrong here. And then the next thing she said, which had an equally big impact, is, uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to, you know, have anything to do with you if this is the real you. And that was like a slap in the face because what she was saying is, you've changed. You know, the power of the situation has transformed you from, from the person I thought I knew to this person that I don't know. And at that moment, I said, wow, you're right. We got to end it. After only six days, Dr. Zimbardo shut down his experiment. So how did I deal with this heroic challenge of my authority as the superintendent of the Stanford Prison Experiment? Um, what I did is we were married the next year at the Stanford Chapel. <laughs> And uh, 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 this August, we had our 46th wedding anniversary. So uh, with that, we make a dynamic switch. So she pushed me in this direction of saying, enough of this evil stuff. It's time, it's time for heroism. So HIP is a nonprofit organization that uses social psychological lessons to train youth. We focus mostly on high school and college youth, and now with corporations, how to stand up speak out and take wise and effective action to change the world. So it's really taking Obama's message, uh, focused on um, uh, Rosa Parks, and saying, no, we can do this using psychology uh, that we know uh, uh, can make good people do bad things to make ordinary people do heroic things. Uh, 
so this is this is a cartoon that was um, made for me um, in Hungary, which, uh, where our program is um, uh, probably most widely uh, developed. Hello, I'm Phil Zimbardo, president and founder of the Heroic Imagination Project. Our main focus is promoting the idea that heroes are ordinary people who take extraordinary action in challenging situations in their lives. They're effective heroes do the right thing when other people are doing the wrong thing or more often when they're doing nothing and also to expose evil uh, in all of its many forms as a whistleblower. We believe heroism begins in the mind, begins with thinking about yourself as a hero, thinking about yourself as having an inner hero that we will help express through our lessons, our ways of rethinking the nature of good and evil. So this is what we've been doing. And again, I, we have one lesson on transforming people who are passive bystanders. You see somebody hurt, you see somebody in need, and most people pass by and do nothing. So we teach them how to uh, analyze those situations. We use provocative videos that I've created and we use uh, from Candid Camera, from other, other places, that, things I've used in my Stanford classes, uh, to teach people how to be upstanders. Uh, Carol Dweck in the psychology department has pioneered the work of psycho psychology, which she calls mindsets. Most of us have a narrow fixed mindset, uh, which limits ourselves. And the important thing is developing a growth mindset. The gross mindset means everything, every action, every ability is improvable with, act, with effort and with practice. And we teach young people how to do that. Um, so we inspire heroism. A hero acts on behalf of others in need or defend a moral cause. The problem with studying heroism uh, uh, in terms of research, heroes are modest and humble. Almost always when somebody does a dramatic heroic deed, they say, wow, that was really heroic. They'll always say, no, I did what anyone could do. It's, I'm really not special. Uh, now, heroes are usually ordinary, everyday people, as Obama had mentioned, but it's their actions uh, in, in challenging situations that, that are extraordinary. So again, we're moving away from the individual dispositional thing to it's, it's what they do that matters. But again, as Obama said, heroism creates a positive ripple effect. When you do something to help other people and somebody sees it, it increases the likelihood that they will do that. And we see this in our lessons. When students see other students helping rather than bullying or harming, it increases the, the positive cooperative uh, nature. Um, so since the Stanford Physics Experiment, I've given up evil, no more dining in hell. Uh, I will only promote goodness and heroism in my new life. So we start with small steps. And one of our lessons is focus on others. That is, in every situation you're in, where there are strangers, uh, make somebody feel special. We started this when, when we, again, we're working in the shyness clinic. When you, you go to a party, you go to some, notice somebody who's not engaged, who's sitting in the corner, and make it your business to go over, introduce yourself, ask their name, remember their name, and try to start up a conversation. Uh, and then at the end, give a compliment. It could be how they look, uh, you like what they said. Uh, uh, so make them feel special. Again, what is your ripple effect? Remember, your actions, when you do the right thing, and people notice, increase the likelihood they'll do it. Your actions, when you don't do anything, when you are a passive bystander, you encourage other people not to get in involved. So heroes are sociocentric. The enemy of heroism is egocentric. If it's about you, it's, you're not gonna be about helping others. So really, change your perspective. Me becomes we, I becomes us. And these are the simple messages that we, try, we get across in our Heroic Imagination program. So hip in business, as I said, uh, in, in, in Budapest, uh, uh, they call, our hero program is called Hero Square. And they have taken our, they're in a, where our lessons are in a thousand high schools all over Hungary, but now they also extend these into business, into Mercedes-Benz, Telecom, and others. Uh, it, in business, it forces cooperation uh, it promotes responsibility within the company and between workers. And again, one of our programs is bias reduction, reducing stereotypes and prejudice, and uh, making people focus on understanding others and appreciating differentness, differentness in ethnicity, differences in gender. Uh, and we show that it increases worker efficiency and better performance of workers in teams uh, in organizations. What, what happens is we have these lessons, and each lesson is three or four hours, uh, uh, the lesson is packaged with videos, with questions and answers, um, and the lessons are licensed. 
you license uh, schools or school systems or you license the lessons for three years because we, we update them uh, every two or three years. But then in order, in order for the school to use a lesson, they also have to hire a trainer. And I am the international trainer. So I go around all these places in the world and I train 10 to 20 teachers or 10 to 20 uh, people in human relations. And then at the end, they're certified to become me, to do the training. Uh, and so we're only in the West Coast of the United States, California, Oregon, Arizona, and I guess in Michigan. Uh, we have not, even though I'm a New Yorker, we have not gotten across the country, so we have to, have to put that on our agenda. So as I said, in Budapest, we're in 1,000 high schools everywhere. We're in London, England, in, in Portugal, in Krakow, Warsaw, in Poland, uh, Bali, Indonesia, in Tehran, and even in many right-wing places, in Geelong, Australia, Prague, Czech Republic, Buenos Aires, and Bratislava. Now, the interesting thing is my family is Sicilian, and we started a program uh, in Palermo, a hero program. And curiously, even though the Sicilian government is very poor, they invited a few years ago a, a thousand uh, African migrant youth, ages 17 to 20, to come to Sicily, to come to Palermo. They had a, a, a nice housing for them, clothing, uh, and sent them to school. And now our program comes in, and we teach these kids how to be te uh, lecturers, trainers. And now these African youth who are black and Muslim go into Italian schools, kids are white and, and Catholic, but now they're the leaders, they're the teachers, but they're the same age. And now they get not only, an, they get enormous amount of respect, and in addition, for each class they teach, we give them a little bit of money, half of which they send home. So now we show that their pride has changed. They feel not only welcome, but they feel special. And so this is how a heroic imagination project uh, is having a powerful effect at the individual level as well as uh, at the corporate level. So I'd love you to visit us, heroicimagination.org, www. Uh, if you want more information, just admin at heroicimagination.org. Uh, and with that, uh, what a brighter future looks like to me is peace replaces war. I think there's not been a day since the end of World War II where there has not been a war somewhere in the world. Compassion rules over fear, understanding and acceptance overcome prejudice and discrimination. And ultimately, heroes dominate villains. So with that, I thank you for your attention and caring. Thank you. <laughs>